Greetings to our audience all over the world. Welcome to another Together for Impact podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the Donita Fellowship Center in partnership with MS Training Center for Development Cooperation. It is run under our partnership that we have for promotion of work around good governance, stability, and green transition. We are very keen on promoting learning. We are very keen on ensuring that there's knowledge, there's knowledge in action, that there's change happening in the communities we work in. Uh, and we are also very, very keen on ensuring that information finds its way to communities so that they can solve the problems affecting them. We are joining you from the MS Training Center in Arusha, where we are having the pleasure of hosting a very, very amazing couple. We are talking about two uh, um, so, uh, theorists and consultants on, on social learning who have been doing a lot of work around the world to, to teach people about how to be able to, to, to create communities of practice. Let's get to know you. My name is Beverly Wenger Trainer, and uh, Etienne and I, we're both married and we have a professional partnership. Well, I think uh, I'm actually interested in social learning and social learning capability. And by that, we mean people learning from and with each other. And I'm interested in that. I mean, before I got into learning, I was I was an activist. I was actually a political activist. And it sort of matured into a thinking that unless we get better at learning to make a difference, we're going nowhere. You know, I'm 64 now. When I was in my 20s and 30s, I was such an activist. I look back and I think, wow, what did I not know? That was, on the whole, not very inspiring, Bev, when you look back on your life. But I think that by, I think I would have done better by being better at learning from what I was doing, learning from other colleagues who were doing the same kind of thing. Yeah, and developing a learning capability. So really, for me, my interest in learning capability is my interest in, yeah, in m- enabling people to learn to make a difference. So my name is Etienne Wenger Trainer, and as Bev said, uh, we, we work together and we live together. And uh, for me, my journey has been more through theoretical development. Actually, I was a teacher um, and I was very interested in teaching. But over time, I came to understand that teaching the way it is often understood is kind of like the, the transmission of certainty from someone who knows to someone who doesn't. But in fact, a lot of the learning that we do in life is not by transmission of certainty from one person to another, but by engaging with each other to, to address something that nobody knows. And so for me, it became a, a, a way of, because you know, you were talking about communities of practice. You were talking about people learning together. You know, we've been doing this from the, from the beginning of humankind, mm-hmm. you know. But in terms of a language and, and, and a theory, we have a lot more for the cognitive process of transmission of a curriculum, mm-hmm. you know. And we don't have very good language to give rigor to this less formal, less structured way that people come together when they want to make a difference and they recognize each other as sharing in wanting to make a difference and there's this partnership being established. Mm-hmm. We don't have, we, we know that's the way it happens and we know that that's the way meaningful learning happens, but we don't have very good language to give rigor to what we do and to become more intentional about recognizing it, supporting it, also evaluating it. And so, yeah, for me, I I think I share this this passion that Bev has to to save learning from the way institutions have have, uh, put it in a box, you know. Uh, But we understand that if institutions are going to give... a body to this way of learning. They need some rigorous way of talking about it. They need some rigorous way of saying of saying when it happens, how it happens, and whether we can see if it has happened. So that's 
that's kind of my trajectory uh, in, into this. In, in, interesting, very interesting. Learning differently, learning together, ensuring that it's not a teacher instructing, but people mm-hmm. learning from each other. I should also inform you that we have DFC alumni network coordinators from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and all these people in one room, some who have met, some who have not met, have had an opportunity to have a conversation with each other. And light bulbs kept on going on at different times, learning from different directions, as you would hear from Beverly and Etienne. They've also taken the stance where they are not instructors, they're learning from the the, the group that they're working with, even as the group learns from them. And it's interesting uh, uh, because they also have a, a name that they call this concept, even as they were introducing it. They were talking about learning together. Why is it is imp- why is it important to learn together? Why is it important that learning happens in the way that um, we are all gathering information together and not in a way that one person is instructing? Well, I mean, we are not against one person instructing. You know, if you're going to learn some algorithm where it's just a matter of following the procedure, that's fine. You know, you you learn that. You know, that's fine. And you know. I don't know history or things like this. You know, where, where, where you don't have access to to uh, to the information, it's fine. You know, or re- you read a book and you learn by by reading a book. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But there is that moment where you really need a partner, where you really need a partner to help you make progress. You know, and that's that moment that that we cherish. Uh, not to put down professors who give lectures and mm-hmm. fantastic lectures and people. No, there's not, we don't put that down. But we say it's not enough. It's not enough. You fi- have to find that moment where a companion in life works with you to, ha- to help you mutually make, pro- to help each other make progress. And that's what, that's what we are working on. We're not trying to put down other mm-hmm. uh, 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 other work but but we say if you're going to really make a difference that partnership for human beings is really an essential dimension of how you grow into a person who can make the difference you get to make i was going to say that it's also it's important it's not just necessarily you know, multiple people together, so that's better. It's who's together. One of the important things, because you can you can have conversations, you can bring people together, you can ask them to collaborate, you can bring people together, but unless the people with you have some appreciation for the difference it is that you want to make, they may not be the right learning partners for you. So there's something very sp- special in terms of learning in terms of finding the right learning partners. Because it's not just throwing any old people in the room and saying, okay, things are better now because you're because you're together. It's finding the right people who appreciate each other's yeah, I- appreciate each other's struggle down to the, the basic business of of how it works in practice. And so yeah, it's not just any old people together. This this art of finding the right people must be also the basis or the the concept behind uh, the cre- creation of communities of practice. And you spent the last two days sharing that with us. Maybe share with our audience uh, what a community of practice is and, and why it is important to create communities. I'll of turn that to Etienne because he was the one who coined the term. So a practice is not just that you do something, but that over time you develop medical practice, you develop legal practice, you, you, you develop shared ways, sh- recognize, recognizable shared ways of doing things. That that become part of how, how you live and how you recognize competence mm-hmm. uh, uh, in each other. So, so I, th- I think it's really important to say that it's, it's just a name that we have given to something that people have already known. Um, and so a community of practice is a very simple concept. It's a group that are trying to achieve something and work together to learn how to do it better over time you know, and it it is a learning partnership, okay. But it is a learning partnership. That's why we call it a committee of practice. Is it a learning partnership that's based on something that people do, 
you know so it's not a community of information it what what brings that intensity of learning in a in a community of practice is the recognition that you are struggling with something i understand you know and so so yeah we call it a community of practice. i think it's important to say that even though the concept itself was brought together in in a book that came out in 1991 the concept has been with humankind since forever you know we were in a cave and we were wondering why the bear escaped what should we do t- tomorrow and we were acting as a community of practice so maybe being a community of practice is is fundamental mm-hmm. to what it is to be human mm-hmm. you know to be in in that in that partnership to try to do so, to do something better and over time establishing a practice you know mm-hmm. yeah. L- let me let me push it a little further with you Etienne uh, why is it important for you that um la- uh, building of communities of practice remains a learning experience is it because they are constantly different as they form well i mean we don't care about building communities of practice mm-hmm. really what we care is that people find learning partnerships mm-hmm. you know uh actually in our most recent book we also introduced that, uh, uh, the concept of a social learning space which may not be a community of practice long term but still has that that richness and characteristic of mutual engagement and trying to make a difference together so for us as and i think that's what exactly what bev was saying earlier we are interested in how do you increase the learning capability of of a group uh or or a system or, or you know whatever field you're interested in mm-hmm. how do you improve the learning capability that is um that is embedded in the social fabric mm-hmm. of that group how, how do you work with that you know that's what we're interested in mm-hmm. you know because you know so if a company calls us and and says oh we would like to have 23 communities of practice by christmas you know how much is it going to cost mm-hmm. we're not interested in that See, we're not interested in oh community of practice let's check the box you know mm-hmm. some people say oh you know we are working together but we're not sure we are really a community of practice mm-hmm. for us we don't care i i i, I are you having a great experience are you, are you, are you learning are, are you developing your capability you know uh, so so the point is not to be a community of practice the mm-hmm. purpose of a community of practice is not to be a community of practice according to the definition of the wenger trainers mm-hmm. you know the point is can you open a space where something meaningful essential can happen for people who, who care to make a difference and whatever is necessary to make learning happen in a community of practice is what Beverly and Etienne are interested in um they do a lot of work to support organizations and individuals um uh in order for them to be able to learn better and some of the ways that they do it is through running workshops they have coaching sessions they have consultancies that they do to support di- uh, 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 different entities and they have written books one of them is a book that they've written on communities of practice please find it somewhere read it and see if you can practice some of the 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 information that they have offered in the book but the other area that they have written on is value creation how you know that learning learning has happened is if the learning eventually results in some change somewhere especially a place that is much further away from from the place where learning happened and they have written on value creation in social learning spaces i am going to invite beverly to just share with us what is this value creation about actually we're interested in i would say eight types of value but we're interested in the way in which uh, value flows or translates into the other so when you have a what we're really interested in is if you have an intervention right what does it lead to you know how close does it lead you to making the difference that you care to make if you're enjoying something if you're finding something meaningful you may not even being enjoying it actually but if you find something meaningful a conversation an activity if you find it meaningful then you're more likely to get out some ideas some insights new new friends to uh to call on when you have a problem and you can do something about it and that's value but you would also hope that what you're taking away from that activity and that meaningfulness is 
changing your practice because in the end what we want is people to change the way they do things on the way to making the difference and so we want to see that the things that people are taking away are translating into action and that action is making the difference that the person cares about and so when we talk about learning and social learning being about learning to make a difference that you care about then yes we found that creating that value or that sort of value chain in a way, that flow through those different value cycles is one that brings you closer to making the difference you want to make. And if, for example, if, for example, you have, there's some, you're doing something, you're having a conversation with certain people, if that is not generating a meaningful experience for you, then part of the learning is also saying, oh, well, what could I do that would do that? Or if it's very meaningful, but it's not generating any ideas, then you're learning, you're learning that that activity is not going to help you generate ideas. Or if it's generating lots of ideas, but you're not doing anything with those ideas, then you learn that those ideas are nice enough in themselves, but you need more than that if you want to make the difference. Uh, so there's a lot of learning, learning cycles and feedback cycles happening as you create value. And, and just, just to add, you know, one of the reasons we focused on what we call value creation, which for us, as I was saying, value is related to making a difference, so not financial value or, or, or moral value. Except it, the difference may be moral. Or uh, yeah, 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 of course. But, but, but our, our use of the term value is, is as I was saying, pushing towards the ability to make a difference. In part, it's because working with communities of practice in organizations, we found that people had f had criteria to judge, uh, uh, for instance, somebody who is a leader in a community to, to evaluate their work, you know, by saying, you know, how, members, how many members do you have? How often do you meet? Uh, 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 how, many, how many people post on your discussion board? These kind of uh, uh, easily... Um, uh, evaluatable aspects, you know, and we say, but it doesn't matter, you know, it's much better to have a community of practice of three people who are really learning to make a difference than to have a community of 2,000 people who are just like not sure why they're there, you know. So we, we started to write about value creation to say, if you want to seriously evaluate a learning process, you need to have deeper criteria than this surface features you know and so that that's for us that's how, how we uh, we started to to develop a framework to to give some rigor to actually seeing and following the value that learning uh, 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 creates in the world um, because because you know the good thing about county members is that it's rigorous you know like 200 is we count it, and that's 200. So people feel, feel good because it's rigorous, but it's meaningless, you know? So, so there's a, always a tension between rigor and meaningfulness, right? And so for us, we were saying, can we give some rigor to meaningfulness so that we can stop asking uh, community leaders, you know, how many posts they have, and to say, what difference are, are those posts making? It's better to have three posts that make a big difference than to have everybody posting, 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 and it, it leads nowhere. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our own trajectory into focusing and, and writing a whole book on value creation. Mm -hmm. And what I noted from the conversation is that one of the most important uh, um, factors in, in value creation is actually being aware that it's happening. And you took us through a, uh, a, a process of, of storytelling that would then keep all the details that are needed for that kind of cycle of learning to happen. Are you able to just, in a, in, in a, in a, in a short brief, explain to our audience what, what should they not forget as they're telling the story about value that is created? Well, uh, the most important thing to forget, uh, not to forget, is that you what you're doing is showing how an intervention, whether that intervention is a conversation or something bigger, but you're trying to show that that intervention has contributed to a change in the world. So you need to be able to tell a good story that takes you from the intervention 
through to a change in the world. And because we have, we found that very often in networks or communities, community members and even community leaders will say, no, we have great meetings. We do good stuff. Full stop, right? But what you want to hear is what has that led to? What difference in the world has that led to? And so when you're telling a value, what we call a value creation story, you need to be able to take people in a convincing way through the way in which a conversation, which was meaningful, led to a very specific idea that led you to change something very particular in your practice and which has at least contributed to the difference that you care to make. Um, so the thing not to forget is really when you're talking about the value of what you do, don't stop at, it was great. <laughs> stop when you've said why it's great, why it has brought you closer to a difference in the world, even if that difference is tiny or minuscule, but you want to know the difference. And you want to go beyond testimonials. Okay. That's where the rigor for us is because you get testimonials. You know, you get, oh, you know, I've been in my community of practice of teachers for two years now and I'm a much better teacher. That's great. We, don't, we have nothing against saying that. But for us, it's a testimonial. We take you at face value. If you give me an example of something like Bev was saying, an idea, and show me how it changed your teaching practice and your student understood the triangle, uh, uh, is also a triangle or, so, or something. That's much more convincing, you see, than to just tell me that you, you've become a much better teacher. So what we have developed is a, is a way to, to, to make it very plausible for, some, for, for an audience that it, it was this intervention that actually, because, you know, your students are doing better now. Uh, it could be, I don't know, the, the, the neighborhood has become gentrified. And so of course, you, your students are better or whatever. It can, be, it can be all sorts of factors that make your students better at math than, than the fact that you belong to this community of practice. So if you want me to, if you, if you want to claim that this community of practice has been, has been important, I need to know, I need data about what this community has done exactly for you. And because you are the one who belongs to the community and you are the one who takes stuff from the community and does something with it, your story is an important piece of data because you've done it, that's you, you know? So you are the carrier of the value of the community into the world. Tell me the story of the carrying of that value. Mm -hmm. Then you, you can convince me that, oh yeah, I should support this community. I should, I should, I should pay for donuts when they have meetings. One of the interesting things that I've observed in the last two days of interacting with Beverly and Etienne is that they have a strange symphony in how they deliver a session. Normally when we have two instructors in a room or two teachers in a room or two lectures in a room, they speak uh, one session after the other. These two people that I have in my, on my panel speak at the same time and I have not seen one moment when they interrupted each other. I want to know, is it something to do with them being a couple or there's <laughs> something they have learned? Is it years of working together? I don't even who's, know who's going to respond to this question, but there's something extremely beautiful about how you deliver. What is that about? I love it if when people notice that, I mean, we don't notice it, but uh, um, several people have said that mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it, it, it's very significant, so thank you. I honestly don't know. I think it's because we spend a lot of time talking to each other. You know, one of us can, usually me, I wake up very early and it'll be, hey, Etienne, I just thought, and then I come up with an idea. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's before we brushed our teeth. And so there is a sort of rolling on through the day where we might be writing a shopping list, for example, and then one of us has an idea mm -hmm. or one of us has just woken up. So part of it is to do with with uh, living together. But we were work colleagues. We knew each other and we were friends and we were work colleagues for a good 10 years before uh, we started a relationship. So 
maybe that also. So we we were already working well together. And many people, actually, many people in our network all also said, you, you two work very well together. So I don't know what it is. By the way, that does not mean that I don't get frustrated with him. <laughs> it just doesn't come out. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I think there is an ingredient there. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, 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 I just thought about that after your question and after. I think that there is a deep appreciation for what the other person is bringing. Uh -huh. See, I think we have a deep appreciation for the co the contribution. For me, when when she speaks, I'm like you. I, I listen to her and I'm trying to learn. And I think I think it's reciprocal. Because we have complementary uh, 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 perspectives, but but with a deep appreciation uh, of each other, and I think that's probably at a, at an emotional level or at a psychological level one of the key for why it's so it's such a pleasure to to work together. One of the the, the lessons that you've been sharing with us is that. Um, you you are trying as much as possible to develop learning capabilities where people appreciate what everybody is bringing into the room, and maybe I want you to share with our audience what is wrong, what what is wrong with the current learning patterns or the way we have been doing learning. What does it take away from the learning process? There's nothing wrong with it. When what needs to be known is already known and can be transmitted quickly and efficiently, but what's so in that way, it's, it's good. What's wrong with it is when the world is changing so fast. If you wait until something is known, mm -hmm. then it's too late, right? So you need, what you need to do when you're learning is to be able to learn from practice what is happening now on the ground and how are we going to uh, make progress in this practice? How are we going to get better at doing something with it in a way that will bring us closer to making that difference we want to make. And that's a different set of questions as to where is the expertise? How can we bring it into the room? How can we give it to people? How can we best package it so that they have it? It's more like you already know, guys. You already know so much. And you on your own might not know it, but actually with others and in conversation with others, you do know it. And that was in these few days, I mean, I think it's amazing. The The agenda was set by people, the problems they faced in practice, and people organized their own activities in order to address those issues. And the amount of knowledge in the room about what to do and the synergies in the room was phenomenal, much more than, you know, than anybody else could deliver to them. And I'm sure my audience is asking, before I, I move on to Etienne, I'm sure my audience is asking, what, how do we make people learn better? What are the, some of those tools that you, are, you used to make the magic happen in the last two days? Well, I don't know if you mean practical tools, but a sort of underlying fundamental tool is, um, or concept, is a true belief in agency. How enabling people to have agency, to take agency, um, is fundamental to learning. You know, when you go to school, one of the main things, and in, even in training, one of the main things that happen is agency is taken away from you, right? Learn this, and then you'll know what to do. It, somehow it bypasses who you are and what you bring to the table and what you can do with it and the difference you care to make. And so always at its essence, we're thinking, how do we enable agency here so that people can really get better at articulating the difference they want to make and articulating the ways they think it can happen? And so really it's a belief in agency. Mm -hmm. and, and, maybe and just to add to that, this is really what is wrong, mm -hmm. you see? Uh, because, yeah, there are cases where you just have to transmit a curriculum, mm -hmm. right? But the way that it has transformed into education is that the transmission of the curriculum has taken over the whole thing, you know? And so many students go to, go to, uh, uh, to school and they are asked to forget about meaningfulness, mm -hmm. you know? Just put this in your head, pass the test. 
and go on and live, you know? And so part of part of this is, and, and I think it is related to agency very much so, because people want agency, people want to make a difference. But when you have when you are in a, in a in a learning system where this is completely ignored you feel like well this is meaningless and for many many students the schooling process is viewed as my my sense of meaninglessness my identity who i am is is put on hold until i pass the test and then i have to, to go into the world and do something with it and I, i'm not i'm not clear what it is you see what i mean so I think the secret of what we do is opening a space where people can engage their sense of meaningfulness, mm -hmm. their sense of who they are, and, and, and have that manifested in the very moment of learning. And, and I really believe that learning something with a sense of meaningfulness, with a sense of agency, that it's going to make a difference to you and to the world mm -hmm. results in a very different form of knowledge than having to learn something where you have to put yourself on hold. You know, it may be the same curriculum, but if you have to put yourself on hold, it results in a very different sense of what it means to know and what it means to engage in the world. So, so for us, really, everything that we do is directed at enabling people to bring who they are and who they want to become and the world that they want to see into in into the energy of learning you know when when addressing an audience that is used to the instructor or the expert delivering information there is a certain kind of resistance that comes from the audience like they, they want to know at what point will you start giving information or or the one to know at what point are you going to start writing notes and listening to what you're saying? How do you navigate through that? Because I noticed it does not make you uncomfortable. You keep pushing the learner to, to, to engage their agency to learn. How do you manage to ignore all that so that then you can allow the learner to now come up and bloom like we have today where everybody understood that this is our assignment for learning and they kept on you know, giving as much of, the same, of themselves as they could to promote the learning that was happening? I mean, in terms of giving information, you wait until information is pulled from you. Mm -hmm. So you... You create, a, you create the conditions in which people want to know. And when people want to know, they pull things from you. And in fact, for example, we had a PowerPoint presentation prepared. We, we didn't need to, we didn't turn it on. In fact, we did show, I think, one or two slides. But people started asking questions. And we answered in, you know, we, we did our presentation th really through the questions that people were asking. And... The beauty of that was people were asking in their own language, from their own context, and we could respond in their own language and in their own context. But it was exactly what we were going to show in the slides. So people, you know, people think we were answering their questions. In fact, we were presenting our slides. <laughs> but it's also that, you know, we are nervous. You know, maybe you don't see that, but we are always nervous. When we go to an, a, a workshop like this, because it doesn't show. <laughs> <laughs> because to tell you the truth, there's no guarantee it's going to work. You know, there's no guarantee that people having spent three weeks in Denmark are going to find enough of a connection with each other that they're going to have the energy to to engage and and, and and learn together. So, but over time, I think we have relaxed a little bit. Well, I'm still nervous, but we've got to gain a faith that if you open a space for people to engage in meaningful, agent, agency-full learning, they grab it. Mm -hmm. They go for it. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they're not used to it or something, but there is an energy there. So over time, our doubts or our anxiety about is it going to work or not have faded a bit because again and again, we simply open the space and we, you know, actually we are light, very light facilitators, you know, because we, we feel that if you over facilitate, you close the space. So we, we tend to be a bit like let the chaos happen because our experience is that through the chaos, something beautiful 
comes up, it, it's kind of a faith, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a faith in, in the human spirit that if you open a space for it, well, they do it. And like t today, you know, I was, I was really emotional at the end of, of, of the workshop because it was like, you know, people were so, seemed so grateful, you know, and it's like, we didn't do anything, anything extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> we just, we just let you guys do it, you know? <laughs> so, so it was like, that's great, you know, but, but, but it's been, and, and, and it's been cross-cultural, you know, it's not like, you know, only Americans do that or only Europeans or only Africans or only South, South Americans, you know, it, it, over time, if you, if you do it enough, we haven't seen yet a culture where people don't jump into that space when, when it's truly open, sincerely open, not, not a trick, you know, not like facilitation tricks, you know, but sincerely, yes, we want to engage in some meaningful form of learning together because we care to make a difference and we want to know how to make the difference better. And when you open that space, it's amazing to see the human being come out. If you're keeping up with this conversation, <laughs> you have heard that there are certain questions that we're asking ourselves. Number one, are you learning? If you're learning, how are you learning? Are you learning alone or are you learning with other people? Have you identified who knows what you're looking for? Are you ha Have you identified who knows what you're struggling with? What kind of associations have you created with these people? How do you relate with them? How do you relate with the knowledge that they have? What kind of spaces have you created for the knowledge they have to benefit you in your, in, in your, in your community? How are you using the knowledge that you gain from other people even as you learn? And as you're using that knowledge, how do you tell the story of the change that is happening without necessarily taking credit for everything, but only announcing what little contribution you have made to the change that is happening in your society? There is so much to discuss with Etienne and Beverly. I can't believe that the time is almost up. I'm going to allow them to give us their parting shot. And in giving their parting shot, we're also giving them a test. They <laughs> say that they learn from the groups that they work with. They have been working with the DFC alumni network coordinators for the last couple of days. Beverly and Etienne, what did you learn from this group? What were some of the most exciting things that you picked up and what is your parting shot to my audience? Well, the first thing is a confirmation <laughs> that when you open the space for people to focus on how to make a difference, they grab it. So it's... I don't know if it's learning because we already knew that, but it's every day that that, that happens is a confirmation that we are onto something. So for us, we are very grateful that people, you know, kind of welcomed us into into their, their struggle and that we, we work together. Now, there are very specific things that you learn, that we learned, for me at least. We, there was an activity that actually didn't work quite the way we expected and we had a reflection on why it was that and, and for me, I'm going to think of this activity a bit differently, you know, because there, in that process of reflection, uh, I understood things about the way this activity uh, is, is, is structured that I had not understood before. So that's a very small example of what it means to, to, to appreciate the learning partnership that happens when, when you work with people. Beverly, what did you learn from, from uh, the alumni coordinators? Well, again, it's something I've been thinking about, So, but it was really extra com confirmation of it. Is the, I don't know if I can describe it well, is that the, the way in which, I mean, these networks here are local in the sense that they're in their country, in the country, and the way in which people now, young people now, are juggling with different networks, different communities of practice, whether or not they're called communities of practice, the cross communities of practice, the possibility for opening spaces for new conversations and for new alliances is huge. It just feels like it's all moving um, in this sort of way, in this wave like this of network and, uh, and community of practice. And how complex that is for people growing up now. It's not just one network or one community. It's multiple and it's crossing and it's changing and it's at different levels of scale. And I think that's terribly complex. And it also makes me think, it makes me think, 
we really do have to keep on working at this because this is this is the context in which people are learning to make a difference now. My parting shot is, uh, can it be about anything? Anything at all. Well, my parting shot is that I have absolutely loved being here, all right, in this, in this center. You know, I've always been very, um, uh, you know, in my activist days and when I, I absolutely was such a big fan of Julius Nereri, <laughs> whatever your politics are, but I absolutely was such a fan of his. And I'm so, I feel honored really. And a lot of my um, inspiration has come from Tanzania. And I just love to come to a place like this, which is something that, I mean, we now have our own social learning lab in Portugal, but I always wanted a place like this. And I feel so happy to see it here in Tanzania. Excellent. Etienne? Well, I guess my parting shot is, it's amazing that people who have been to Denmark for a few weeks and who come back to want to make a difference, you find such deep connection and such deep mutual engagement. <coughs> and it's wonderful that they are doing that across the globe, you know, because, yeah, of course, they are focused on, on, on the national uh, networks, but, but I think they are, they are finding their broader global citizenship, in some sense, by, by, by belonging to this network. And I think that's, that's wonderful. There you have it. The Together for Impact Partnership has brought you another podcast where you get to, you got to learn about communities of practice, value creation with some of the best world-renowned theorists and, uh, uh, um, and consultants on social learning. There is more conversation that we could have had. We are, we are out of time. We are definitely not out of content. There are ways that you can interact with Etienne and Beverly Wenga. Please visit their website and find out what they do. Reach out to them if you need their support to facilitate your workshop so that you can also get the experience that we've had here today. We have had quite some days of learning and we cannot wait to see what the DFC alumni network coordinators are going to create out of the good work that has been done in the last couple of days. As they go back home, we are also looking to see what value has been created even as they move around. Is there something you've picked out of this conversation? Kindly comment, uh, uh, leave your insights because we continue to learn from you even as you're learning uh, from us. We commit ourselves to promoting learning and, and, and sharing enablers on uh, good governance, um, uh, stability, as well as green transition. And we welcome all of you to also take a chance or an opportunity to come and visit this center and enjoy what Beverly has said she's really enjoying out of this center uh, in Arusha. This is us signing out um, for today. Until next time. <laughs>